Imagine you arrive in the afterlife. Now, there are lots of different lines of people waiting for different teller windows, much like you'd have in a crowded post office. Now, you're queuing up for a window above which is a sign that reads, Fatal Animal Attacks. You look around to take it all in, and you discern that you have to be processed before they let you through the turnstile to all the good afterlife stuff. You hear the people queuing ahead of you, chatting. While I accidentally startled a grizzly bear while hiking in the forest, and it mauled me to death. Someone else says, I succumbed to a bee swarm triggering my allergies. The guy behind you says, Something spooked my heifers and I got crushed by the herd before I could get out of the way. They look at you, you wince, and you say, I was rock pulling on holiday and my toe brushed a tiny cute little octopus, so now I'm f***ing dead. Hello, I'm Chuffley, and this is Chuffley's Countries. When you're in England, as I am, and someone tells you to go away, as happens to me regularly, there is a huge country that's almost as far away as you can get. I'm talking, of course, about the Commonwealth of Australia. It's a country with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. Just because Australia is a former British penal colony, don't think for a moment that the entire country is populated with the knuckle-dragging descendants of Cockney thieves. That's only half the story. It's very well known that Australia wants you dead, with all the poisonous, venomous and bitey monsters at every turn. But don't worry, because there's the ever-present prospect of skin cancer everywhere, which helps take your mind off the murderous wildlife. All Australians thrive on a diet of Tim Tam biscuits, Victoria Bitter and meat pies from a van. This winning formula has helped Australia produce some of the finest minds and many skilled athletes. In fact, Australia has produced way more than its fair share of talent in every art form and in every area of science. And to top it all, they are masters of the low-budget daytime drama. With every successful Australian cultural export, I am inspired to eat more pies, drink more beers, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. I went there once. Same accent everywhere. You see, in my corner of the world, the accent changes noticeably every 25 miles or so. I read somewhere that Australia is unique in that despite being a vast country, the accent does not vary with its geography. Perth or Sydney, same accent, at least to foreign ears. However, the accent varies substantially over the socio-economic spectrum. For example, there's the beloved Aussie battler. He's hard-working, he'll take no shit, but he's got a heart of gold and his accent is musical. It's expressive and it's authentic. Then there's the uh, middle-of-the-road Australian accent. It's the city suburbs, it's the Sydney ciders and local radio. He's the Aussie everyman. And eventually you'll come to what I describe as posh Aussie, although I'm sure it has a better name. It is to Australian what RP is to English. It's national newsreaders, respected documentary makers and highbrow comedians. It has the plummy round qualities that come from private education and heaps of family wealth. Ah, I'm no good at accents, but I do enjoy them. But what about Australian music? This signature sound of hitting a stick with another stick while huffing raspberries down a hollow log is beautiful and evocative, but perhaps a little limited in certain circumstances. The theme song of Australia, but not the national anthem, is Waltzling Matilda. Now this is about a chap stealing a sheep in the middle of nowhere, getting busted and then evading capture by running off and drowning himself in a muddy pond. An effective solution to a tricky problem and a ripping yarn for a folk song. The actual national anthem of Australia is The Locomotion by Kylie Minogue. So that's my Celebration of Australia, Volume 1. And if you could need any more reason to like Australia and the Australian people, well, they drive on the left just as nature intended. You know England, soggy, miserable place making up most of the grey island in the North Atlantic, if you travel north beyond the border, you will find yourself in a place even soggier, greyer, miserabler, a place of stunning scenery, obscured by the weather, majestic wildlife, also obscured by the weather, and weather. You will have stumbled into Scotland, a country with a fascinating history, a noble people, and a rich culture. I say, okay, the new. <laughs> Hello, I'm Chuffley, and this is Chuffley's Countries. Scotland is the northernmost bit of the island that makes up Great Britain. Thus, the Scots and the English are both British. 
If you are in any way confused by all this, many people have explained it far better than I ever could. Google it. Not now, obviously. Despite being British, the Scots' favourite pastime is hating the English. Don't worry, the English ruling classes have oppressed everyone at some point in history, and modern English people are used to the abuse. It's entirely fair to say that the landed gentry of old that oppressed my English ancestors in serfdom were pretty bloody horrible to the Scots too, and many others besides. Try not to make that fact define your whole personality though. Despite the reliable shade thrown at us by our Scottish brethren, the vast majority of English are rather fond of all things Scottish. It's true that Englanders might tease the Scots with certain stereotypes, but that's what close siblings do. It comes from a place of affection. The Scots give at least as well as they get, and long may the banter continue. Mischievous jibes in peacetime are one thing, but in times of conflict and turmoil, the Scots and the English stand firmly shoulder to shoulder. Bloody good thing too. The Scots are fearsome warriors, and I'm damn glad they're on our side when it comes time to rumble. Are you American? If not, can you approximate an American accent? If so, try this when you next meet a Scottish person. Oh my God, I just love that Scotch accent. Then stand back and enjoy the spectacle. If you'd like to witness further exasperated behaviour, try following up with, I'm one 16th Scottish myself. We have a family tartan. All good fun. I can't do an episode about the good people of Scotland without addressing the elephant in the room. Do I mean elephant? No, I mean haggis. Haggis is a superfood. If you collect everything that is remotely able to survive on a bleak, windswept Scottish mountain, chop it up and shove it inside some random viscera, you will have a herby, sheepy, oaty miracle. It is genuinely one of my favourite breakfast foods. I discovered it one hungover morning many years ago in a dingy pub on Edinburgh's Royal Mile. It looked at me menacingly from beside my baked beans and fried eggs, daring me to try it. Not only does Haggis quickly restore the sore-headed traveller, it renders him functionally immortal for several hours afterwards. It's also bloody delicious, despite all that lung tissue. The Scottish have an actual dinosaur hiding in a lock. I mean, of course they don't, but what's the harm in stimulating the Scottish tourism industry and enchanting impressionable children? Go there, buy a plush cuddly monster and a car sticker. That strange ripple in the water that you saw? Almost certainly Nessie. At the last census, they counted five and a half million people in Scotland. For comparison, there are nine million people in London alone. This is one of the most attractive things about Scotland for me. It's broadly devoid of people. Add to that the landscape and a progressive attitude towards outdoor pursuits and truly enjoying that landscape. And it's no mystery why so many people go there for outside fun, all obscured by the weather. And the Scots are a wise folk too. They invented the television, you know, and the telephone, and all the other things that start with telly. They seem to be dragging their feet when it comes to the teleporter, however. So if you know a Scottish type, give them some friendly encouragement when you see them, get them back to the lab. I haven't mentioned so many things that make Scotland wonderful. The dirty bog water they call Scotch whisky, the nectar-voiced songbird they call the bagpipes, or the urban decay, crime, drugs, shortbread. I shall have to revisit Scotland for another episode in the future. Scotland! Scotland! It's a curious fact, often toted by those who studied languages, that the word bear, and by which I mean the animal, it doesn't actually mean bear. For a number of languages, including English, the word bear has its root in fearful euphemism, and it means something like the brown one, or the terror, or the slashy, bitey, screamy death. Imagine a country that is home to no fewer than four types of bears, including the famously terrifying grizzly bear, and the last word in sleek white death, the pants-wettingly scary polar bear. These monsters, whose names must not be spoken aloud, prowl the countryside and woodland quietly, invisibly watching for prey. Hi, I'm Chuffley, and this is Chuffley's Countries. I speak, of course, of the vast and spectacular country of Canada, a place with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. In Canada, expectant mothers must deliver their babies with particular care due to many of the newborns arriving already wearing hockey skates. Hockey is apparently something of an obsession with our Canadian chums, and because it's a sport, I'm confused and slightly frightened by it. I'll speak no more about it. All Canadians subsist on a meal called poutine. As far as I can make out, this national dish is essentially cheesy chips and gravy. Now, I'll say that again. 
cheesy chips and gravy. Now, according to the internet, um, I can be there in about eight hours. Turns out my passport's expired. In England, where I live, we have a population density of 438 people per square kilometre. Canada has four. That's because they keep getting eaten by bears, of course. But it means that between the cities are endless pristine miles of wilderness. Lakes and mountains, plains and forests, not to mention icy tundra. And yet somehow they have summer heat waves of more than 40 degrees. Oh, speaking of which, Canadians are perfectly civilised metric measuring people, so that's nice. In Canada, the trees bleed breakfast condiments. By carefully tapping an innocent maple, a determined arborist can glean buckets of tree treacle, which can be boiled up and concentrated into the quintessentially Canadian maple syrup. This they pour over bacon, waffles and what have you, giving them a shocking sugar rush to start the day, which is the reason so many foreigners consider Canadians to be so personable. And thank goodness for that, they have a lot of guns. 35 firearms per 100 people, which is admittedly low compared to their southern neighbours, who have 120 guns per 100 people, but still it's a fraction of what they should have given all the bears. Canada seems to be disproportionately represented in lists of international celebrities. In music, it's Justin Bieber, Celine Dion, for starters, and hundreds of actors from William Shatner to Keanu Reeves. Seriously, Google Canadian celebrities. Household name after household name, it goes on and on. What is it about life in Canada that nurtures such talent? That's just one of so many questions I have about Canada. You see, this is the first edition of Chaffley's Countries where I haven't actually visited the country in question. The hope is that seeing this update, the good people of Canada will have a whip round and send me there on a fact-finding mission to report on all the northern wonder. Maybe they'll send me camping in the wilderness, feed me cheesy chips and gravy and tell me where to buy bear repellent. Hello there, and welcome to Chaffley's Countries. From where I sit, just over the murky strait that is the English Channel, you will see the French Republic, a country with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. The French do not like anyone. The French are deservedly famous for their cuisine, consisting solely of bread, cheese and wine. The baguette, so shaped that it would slide down a marching soldier's trouser leg, is the perfect medium to convey ripe camembert cheese from the plate via the mouth to the walls of your coronary arteries. And French wine is some of the best in the world. French producers make so much they can't sell it and it ends up being distilled and used to make hand sanitizer, which was, which was all the rage a few years back. The French national pastime is a game called boule, where players throw a big ball at a little ball. It's a good excuse for standing around in public spaces, smoking cigarettes and shrugging. It provides a welcome break from a gruelling week of setting fire to things as a traditional form of industrial action. Despite stealing their national anthem from All You Need Is Love by the Beatles, the French have a vibrant music scene. The famous folk classics Frère Jacques about uh, Lazy Monk, I think, and uh, Alouette about uh, giving a lark a right good plucking, between them make up the bulk of French music. Only French cars are permitted to be owned in France, and you must choose between the Citroën de Chevaux for those with taste and the Bugatti Veyron for those without. Those not needing a car at all are encouraged to use a bicycle, and to remind everyone they meet that modern bikes were a French invention, as were the tyres. This is why France gets to hold the world's most famous bike race every year, the Tour de something. Why they have to turn perfectly civilised modes of transport into grubby racing sports, I will never know. As well as the filthy English Channel to the north, France also enjoys the Bay of Biscay to the west, wild Atlantic coastlines edged by dense forest. And then there's the French Riviera to the south, where the French beaches are lapped by the Mediterranean Sea. I'm not envious in the slightest. Coming from a cold, damp island in the North Sea, I wouldn't get on with the lifestyle of Nice or Caen. Too sunny, too beautiful, too much wine, too many baguettes. Not for me. Same goes for the French Alps. Places like the ruggedly beautiful Chamonix Valley, with its hiking and mountaineering and skiing. It all seems like a lot of work to me. And the Alps are absolutely huge. We'd have nowhere to put them. Not envious in the slightest. France gets something of a bad rap in the world of international regard. I uh, refer you to Freedom Fries. 
Here in England, there's a certain type of parochial person who takes some glee in bad-mouthing the French. Of course, I'm sure the French have their equivalent, small-minded folk. I suppose it probably comes from the fact that we've been regularly killing each other on the battlefield for the last thousand years. But we live in today's world, and for generations, the UK and France have been firm allies. Long may that continue. Alouette, gentil alouette, alouette, je te blumerai. There is a land to the east of forests and mountains, a spacefaring nation with ancient roots, an emerging economic heavyweight with nuclear weapons. Hi, I'm Chuffley, and this is Chuffley's Countries. Of course, I'm talking about the Republic of India, a place with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. India has just recently overtaken China as the most populous country in the world. It's home to more than 1.2 billion people. If nothing else, just think about the plumbing involved. And that's if they're lucky enough to have plumbing at all. Some sections of Indian society suffer horrendous poverty. But don't worry, India also has 200 billionaires. So that's all right then. 1.2 billion people is a lot of mouths to feed. Well, I mean, it's 1.2 billion mouths to feed. But thankfully, Indian food is some of the best in the world. Did, did I mention I'm thinking of starting a Cooking with Chuffley channel? I might save my comments about the wide variety and wonder of the many different regional culinary traditions of India for that. And if you subscribe and click all the things, you're sure to be among the first to know when Cooking with Chuffley kicks off. You know, they really like cows in India. Actually, it's Lord Krishna, an important god of Hindu scripture, that really likes cows. So uh, cows are treated as VIPs. VICs. This means that cows are allowed to roam around wherever they please. They saunter onto busy city roads, they sit and chew the cud at intersections and drop bovine waste outside street cafes, all with complete impunity. They are not the only animals you'll see on the roads, of course. Elephants, wild and captive, are plentiful in India, and they're used extensively in forestry and other industries, where they can sometimes suffer terrible cruelty. Several organisations are working to improve the lives of these elephants. Working elephants in the state of Kerala, for example, must now retire at the age of 65 and be provided with food and health care in state forests for the rest of their lives. There are others that fund and provide reflectors to adorn the behinds of road-going elephants in an effort to reduce the number of road accidents involving unseen elephants in the fog. They call them butt reflectors. Butt reflectors. Nice. India has many well-educated, intelligent young people, many of whom happen to speak English. Add to this the vagaries of the developing Indian economy and exchange rates for currencies, and you have the perfect storm of skilled technical labour that by Western standards is very affordable. It's offshore outsourcing time. Lots of businesses in the West have saved money by outsourcing many of their functions to India, uh, famously their call centres, but also software development and just about every other digital service. This is why you can call your airline and occasionally encounter a call handler with a perfect command of English grammar and an entirely impenetrable Indian accent. Still, I know only a handful of Gujarati words, for example, and I'm sure my accent is pretty shocking too. India is home to the biggest of the big cats, the breakfast cereal-obsessed orange menace, the tiger. They live in the forests and grasslands and are utterly terrifying. They kill more than 50 people every year. Those moggies are not messing about. I suppose if you're going to be torn limb from limb by a wild apex predator, it might as well be the most mysterious and glamorous of the apex predators. I expect this glamour is why the tiger was chosen as the national animal of India to the disgust of the elephants who thought they had the gig in the bag. And nobody harumphs like an elephant. Imagine a world where life is centred around the enjoyment of amazing local food and wine. Warm sunny weather, ideal beaches and unique architecture. Top off this perfect fantasy with a cultural imperative that you have a nice nap in the middle of the afternoon. Well, it all sounds a bit too good to be true. I'm Chuffley and this is Chuffley's Countries. 
course I'm talking about the Kingdom of Spain, a country with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. Spain hangs off the bottom of France and almost touches Africa while giving Portugal a piggyback. People of Spain are required to support the national economy by consuming nothing but chorizo, paella and rioja. Yes, we're going to talk about pronunciation. Chorizo. It's not pronounced chorizo because it's not Italian, it's Spanish, and they call it chorizo. Make an effort or no sausage for you. Chorizo is a dense pig tube sausage flavoured with paprika, sometimes smoked, sometimes hot and spicy, but always amazing. Paella is not pronounced paella because it's not from Yorkshire, it's from Spain. Make an effort or no savoury rice pudding for you. Have you met paella? Paella is actually the name of the massive flat pan in which they cook the dish. It combines a special variety of rice with spices and meats and what have you from the region. One town might use seafood, the next might use rabbit or chicken. Rioja, sometimes pronounced Rioja, which is also fine. Delivered to every house every morning like milk, it's a really lovely red wine produced in the north of Spain. A charming part of Spanish culinary tradition is tapas. It was invented by enterprising barkeepers as a way to sell more alcohol. The name tapas derives from an old Spanish word meaning, can I just have a couple of those prawns on a tiny little plate, please, mate? The universally understood fact that delicious food on very small plates has fewer calories, therefore you can have 18 of them and a litre of red wine, has led to tapas becoming a worldwide culinary phenomenon. <sighs> I really should stop making these videos when I'm hungry. If you like guitar virtuosity and sexy ladies dancing around with clacky things, well, flamenco might be up your alley. Folky music, dance and theatre from the south of Spain. It's essentially the Spanish answer to Morris dancing. And while it can never have the English Morris dances passion and drama, uh, it's nevertheless a jewel in the Spanish cultural heritage. When aged 18 or so, just before Spanish boys graduate from their local schools and colleges and head off to the world of work or to university, the government sends specially trained observers to spend some time watching the students. These observers are particularly interested in finding those young men who are struggling to achieve emotional maturity and those who fall short with relationships. Controversially, these boys are also observed in the showers after sports lessons. When the government observer identifies a young Spaniard who is both emotionally stunted and in possession of a, a really exceptionally tiny penis, that student is offered a place at Spain's premier bullfighting college. Here, these afflicted young men are trained to dress up in frilly garments and to torture bulls to death in front of crowds of the very worst types of people. It's traditionally believed that the combination of micropenis and entitlement creates the most talented professionals in the bullring. So, go to Spain, eat, drink, spend some money, and come back with the souvenir clacky things. Beer, leather shorts, no speed limits. Well, we've all had weekends like that, but these guys live it full time. Hi, I'm Chuffley, and this is Chuffley's Countries. It is, of course, the Federal Republic of Germany, a country with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. To maintain their German citizenship, each German must eat cabbages, sausages and beer. Cabbages are, of course, one of the most wonderful crops in the world, and Germans have come up with some fantastic ways of eating it. Of course, it's lovely raw, but you can boil it, fry it, pickle it, what have you. You can cut up raw cabbage, salt it, and stick it in a jar to fester in its own filth for months on end. A bacterial fermentation takes place that preserves the cabbage. It sterilises it and makes it absolutely delicious with pizza or, or cold meats or indeed sausages. Sausages are a big part of the German culinary tradition and what's not to like? You get herbs and spices and seasonings, you join all manner of parts from all manner of animals, mix it all up and then pipe it all into a, a sheep or a pig intestine. Bratwurst and frankfurters are amongst the best-known German sausages internationally, but there are countless varieties to discover, if you think your heart can take it. Reinheitsgebot. German words are fun to say. About 500 years ago, some busybody from Germany decided to make it a rule that beer could only be made with three ingredients, namely water, barley and hops. This was ostensibly to ensure a pure, high-quality beer for all the people of the land. 
Of course, it was nonsense. It was just that a lot of beer makers were finding out that wheat is a really good ingredient to stick in your batch. The rich and powerful millers and others who relied on wheat to keep their businesses in profit and their serfs in poverty couldn't have a bunch of hipster brewers increasing demand for wheat and putting up the prices now. So Reinheitsgebot was dreamed up by the powerful to manipulate the market for the benefit of the powerful. Thank goodness that sort of thing doesn't happen today. In modern times, the beer purity laws have been held up as an example of German brewing expertise, particularly when they began to see massive competition from foreign beers. You see, I really like a number of German beers, but I don't like unnecessary rules. If a master brewer decides that a summer ale needs a subtle grapefruit note on the finish, for example, he should jolly well be allowed to chuck a bunch of grapefruits in the blender. Do they use blenders? Germany is ever so good at football, I'm told. Yep, that's all I got for you on that. Germans really good at kicking footballs about. Oktoberfest, beer festival and carnival usually held in November. I have fond memories of attending Oktoberfest in Munich years ago. Every way to eat a pig and being given massive beers by women wearing push-up bras and plaits and standing up to sing Ein Prosit with a lumpa band every few minutes. We have much to learn from the German attitude for partying, that's for sure. I'd like to normalise observing every culture's festivals. Who's with me? There is a land of savannah and forests that exports massive amounts of oil, rubber and chocolate. Indeed, all the things necessary for a perfect night in. I'm Chuffley and this is Chuffley's Countries. Of course, I'm talking about the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a place with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. I am yet to have had the pleasure of visiting Nigeria, but I will always maintain that food is the soul of any culture. I went to a Nigerian restaurant recently. I was staying in part of London with a large West African community, so when I saw an unassuming little place catering for local working people, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. Here's a picture of my meal. It was hearty, robust, with unfamiliar spices, but a familiar burn. Beef stew, jollof rice, grilled plantain, washed down with an African beer whose name escapes me. The food was great, the service was shocking, but at the same time perfectly friendly. I came away with a full belly and changed from £20. If that's typical of Nigerian dining, then I'll try it again as soon as I can. It's certainly not typical of London. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa, but it's tricky to call anyone Nigerian unless it's simply in reference to their passport. You see, Nigeria has more than 250 distinct ethnic groups, and between them, they speak hundreds of languages, variants and dialects. As a result, all road signs in the country have to be bigger than houses and filled with translations for every motorist. I'm sorry I was late for work, boss. I had to stop at a new road sign, and it took me 20 minutes to find out where it said temporary parking suspension. There is a town in the southwest of the country that has a genuinely strange, magical feature. For reasons that confound science to this day, families in the town of Igbo Ora have a startlingly high number of twins. Many people believe that this is down to the diet of the town's women folk, who have a particular fondness for locally grown yams. Igbo Ora yams are thought to contain a special chemical that makes multiple births more likely, and as a consequence, they are completely banned from my house. And a town full of twins is no joke. I mean, criminals can't get convicted. A positive ID is impossible. You were seen and caught on camera holding up the petrol station. Yeah, that wasn't me, Your Honour. That was my identical twin brother. Just like last time? <laughs> yeah, just like last time. In terms of volume, Nigeria has the second biggest film industry in the world, surpassed only by India. As Indians refer to their industry as Bollywood, so Nigerians enjoy entertainment from the huge output of Nollywood. It is the Nigerians' love of homegrown cinema that supports this industry, despite Nollywood's struggle with piracy. Many of the losses filmmakers can suffer due to file sharing are mitigated by the fact that many productions are brought to the public with budgets of less than £15,000. You don't need too much of a share of Nigeria's 220 million strong audience to break even at the box office. And when you've got talented people, nobody cares that you're filming volunteer actors on iPhones. Nigeria is home to an unknown number of undiscovered species. Now we know this because new species are being discovered all the time. As it happens, most of these discoveries are butterflies. 
It would be great if they were finding new species of big cats or presumed extinct dinosaurs in the deep forest, but butterflies are cool too. There are over a thousand species of butterflies in Nigeria and counting. That's a lot of pins collectors are having to buy. Nigeria is the home of the richest person in Africa, a Mr. Dangote, whose net worth is estimated at more than $13 billion. I do not care for billionaires. He has a cousin who is a mere multimillionaire and is currently incarcerated on false corruption charges. His bank accounts are frozen. I know this because I was contacted by his legal representative in Lagos, who had identified me as a morally upstanding chap who would be willing to assist someone facing injustice, particularly when I would be rewarded with almost £10 million for my help. Thankfully, it was simply a matter of my sending £500 to cover some outstanding legal fees and unfreeze the accounts and to secure his release. I expect to receive my reward in the next few days. There is a faraway country made up of over 14,000 islands. It has over 100 volcanoes, active ones. There are daily earthquakes. And if that wasn't hostile enough, there is a countrywide no-shoes-on-in-the-house rule. I'm Chuffley and this is Chuffley's Countries. Of course, I'm talking about the island country of Japan, a place with a fascinating history, a noble people and a rich culture. In Japan, the average age of the shrinking population is 48. A full third of its population is elderly. And what a world that must be. Imagine one in three drivers bimbling about at 35 miles per hour, whatever the speed limit, on high-speed motorways, through school zones, all the time with their indicators flashing. Japanese food is famous the world over. I have been to some very highly regarded Japanese restaurants, but I am yet to find a reason to relive my experience with chicken gizzards. A simple bowl of authentic ramen is a, a perfectly accessible treat. I'd like meat and salad and noodles and a boiled egg, and I'd like it all floating in far too much soup for some reason. Arigato. The big Japanese culinary export is, of course, sushi. Certainly a feast for the eyes. Beautifully prepared sushi is striking on the plate. And sushi chefs certainly have an eye for detail. Unseasoned white rice is rolled up or otherwise constructed with random vegetables and fish into little mouth-sized morsels. It is considered to be a very healthy food, but essentially tastes of nothing. Uh, unless you drown it in soy sauce, delivering a week's recommended allowance of salt in one healthy hit. The exception to this disappointment, in my limited experience, is wasabi. It has all the grunt of a powerful English mustard or horseradish. Wasabi, with its creamy green appearance, gives absolutely no warning that it will twang your trigeminal nerve like a death metal bass player. Wonderful stuff. Japan is, of course, the origin of the ninja. The invisible ones. They hark from feudal times and were the spies, assassins and all-round spooky elite warriors of their day, and are a mainstay of Japanese folklore. They were mostly active from the 15th century, but were a thing of the past by the late 17th century. If you believe that... How could anyone know that there are no ninjas anymore? Isn't it just as likely that ninjas elevated their covert disciplines to such a degree that they can continue to operate right into modern times as shadows and phantoms? Don't take my word for it. Go to any Japanese city. Every ninja will be operating entirely unseen. On a related note, there is such a thing as a nightingale floor. It is a floor in a building or a home that is designed to chirp like a bird when walked upon, thereby revealing the presence of ninjas or anyone else. See, I am bursting with admiration for the shoddy carpenter who, when confronted about his squeaky floorboards, responded, Oh yes, Okyaksama, you see, what I did there was give you a free upgrade to the latest anti-ninja flooring. Matey boy comes through here trying to kill you and you'll hear him coming a mile off. <laughs> Our Japanese friends used to lead the world in consumer electronics, but competition from other markets, China, has diminished that greatly. However, the Japanese are still on top of their game when it comes to building and exporting mind-boggling numbers of quality cars around the world, along with cameras and PlayStations and, I don't know, Pokemon stuff. They reserve all their adult nappy production for the domestic market, of course. Poems of Japan, celebrated by keen minds. Mostly lost on me.